Hello and welcome back to One Earth the Past, a family history and genealogy podcast brought to you by me, Dr. Michaela Hume. So, how has your week been, folks? I hope it's been all right. It's been freezing, hasn't it, here in the UK? Uh, I don't know about you, wherever you are in the country, if you're in the UK, I know we have a lot of listeners in America. It has been so cold. We have had snow and all sorts, frost. I am growing and <laughs> growing some potatoes, which I forgot to cover. So I was going to have them for Christmas dinner, but we'll see what they look like. Um, this week, I am joined by a very, very special guest. He is the future of genealogy and he is doing some absolutely amazing work on mother and baby homes in Ireland. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm podcast welcome to our guest today, Daniel Loftus. Daniel, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Dan, thank you so much for jumping on the podcast. I really, really appreciate it. I think I follow you on all your social media channels and I know that you have quite a fan base, let me tell you. Um, can I ask you, how did you get into this chaos then? How did you start uh, researching your family tree? What was your motivation? Oh, well, I mean, well, firstly, thank you for having me on. I suppose how I got into my family tree would have been uh it would have been january 2017 and it was kind of after a week so not very not, not very cheery you know as a, 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 a wait that was so. that must be the most unique thing i've ever heard of how somebody got into their family tree well it was after a week uh, yeah after a week and a very long car journey home because where i am i'm in cork and the week was in dublin so that's about two two and a half hours and basically, I was playing like 20 questions with my mom and dad, kind of quizzing them on their family and just kind of go like, well, can you tell me about Annie Mae, my granny and or, or Nana Loftus, Nana Granddad, you know, all of that. And I about a couple of days later, I was sitting on the couch, just flicking through Google, trying to find free family tree builders. And I started building my tree on a site called Family Echo. It's still going and I still use it for some trees. Um, and I started building my first one there. And it's always kind of funny to go back and look what my tree looked like. And kind of thinking, oh, my God, you know, look at how much I've kind of gone on since then. And as it kind of kept going, you know, my... Uh, you know, I sat down with my mum one evening, kind of, and I was, I filled out what I knew on Family Echo yeah, and kind of like, okay, well, I know this, I know that, and I know this. So when I did that, I was kind of saying, Mum, can you help me fill some of this in? And she pulled out this book, and it was a nice, The History of Our Family. It was a first anniversary present for my dad on their first wedding anniversary, and on their wedding anniversary. And I believe the idea is first wedding anniversary is paper, and that was that was the or the traditional I think gift is paper or the theme or something I don't know. Uh, but my mum gave my dad that, and lo and behold, my dad was not the one to use it. Uh, it was my mum. So uh, she ended up sitting down with my paternal grandmother who died in two thousand and five when I was about one and a half. So. I didn't have the family tree bug just yet, and I don't know if I was talking a whole lot and could ask very long sentences about, tell me about Nana's dad, you know, different yeah. things like that. Yeah. And so my mum was basically kind of getting all the info from, like, her family and had this big, nice tree about, um, you know, her family and how much she's done, and it was definitely kind of, helpful for me kind of getting started because it gave me something to work from and you know the date she kind of gave kind of as time went on I was able to kind of disprove it because dates we didn't seem to really care a lot about I I know that kind of seems kind of quite rude but kind of we, we generally didn't seem to or like you know dates weren't 
a big deal. So we ended up, um, so we always celebrate my grandmom and uh, Nana Loftus' birthday on um, September 13th. But it was only when my dad went had to renew something that he had to get a copy of his mother's birth certificate. And they rang up the GRO and said, General Register Office, and it said, so, you know, uh, uh, we're looking for the birth certificate of Lava, Lava, um, on, on September, September 13th. 13th. And the year, and, and they, they the general, general register, register office rung them back and just, has said, Well, we didn't exactly find one for September the 13th, but we found one for October the 13th. Would you like a copy? So we got the copy, and lo and behold, thanks to the info that Nana Loftus had written down in the book, we confirmed it was her, and she's October the 13th. I love so that. it's like. So we still celebrate her birthday on September the thirteenth, oh. but her official oh. birthday is October the thirteenth. Oh so my goodness! Kind of a combination of all that would have been probably how I got in, and just trying to, especially like Granddad Colum, who was the brother of the person we went to the wake. Uh, so he died January twenty seventeen, and then my granddad would die in that May. And kind of he was in hospital a lot and kind of he wasn't talking a whole lot and it was hard to watch. But kind of, you know, um, you know, he's very interested that I was doing a family tree and, you know, he's he's, he's very glad, you know. And we just kind of asked him, you know, uh, my mom, because it's kind of here and was sort of going, he was, she's kind of like, you know, who were your parents? And you know, he ju- you could just hear him say, and mum had to go up close to him. Um, you could just like hear him say, you know, Patrick Cleary and Kathleen Foley, and kind of, um, you know, I it was, you know, that was kind of a very big help because that helped me get back, uh, on that bit and I was doing all my own research I had a subscription to Roots Ireland and I was looking at all the lovely uh, birth certificates and or sorry baptisms on there and obviously I was very new to genealogy so at the time what I didn't realise until very much later I was making loads of mistakes <laughs> from the point of I had said oh this woman uh, 19... Uh, born in 1910 was my great grandmother because uh, it was the only one showing up. I didn't know about Irish genealogy die at that point, so I was going off. This is this is fact. This is my one. Yeah, yeah, this is it. Yeah, I'll off. spoil it for you and say no, it wasn't. No. So I kind of I kind of made a number of mistakes at the start, but kind yeah. of you know if you didn't make mistakes, are you really learning on mother and baby homes? And can you just tell me? Yeah, how did you get into that? So, so what was you? You know, how did you sort of come about that research, and what was it that really got you interested in it? Yeah, so this bit I can actually say in full because I wanted to make sure that I could say it uh, before because I'd used to kind of like redact some things or kind of would change some things. But this will be the full story from start to finish. So, about a year. Year, year, almost two years ago, I'd say, I got a text from a cousin of mine in London, and he had said, because uh, obviously I'm the family historian, that people will come to me if there is a, a surname that we share. And of course, the surname was Loftus, my own surname, and said, Hey, I'm going to a band that uh, had, you know, oh, they had the most random name I can't think of off the top of my head. I should remember it, but kind of, he said, I'm going to see this band and they had written a song about the Chew Mother and Baby Home. And the Chew Mother and Baby Home was a, just a brief introduction, was kind of, it was a home that ran from 1925 to 1961. And if you've heard of Chew, the main reason why you would have heard of that is because there has been a mass grave found. Uh, in the remnants of or kind of kind of what would remain of uh, a, a former septic tank as uh, as found on an ordnance survey map by Catherine Corliss and it garnered international attention and because of the way that uh, these children were interred and I use that word very very loosely um, and 
there was one Loftus that died at the home. And he wanted to see if we were related. Long story short, we weren't. We were a little, we were a little uh, far at the beaten track. We come from around a place called Bahola, which is near Kilchima, a little bit away from it. And uh, this one came from Kalala, which is on the um, coast, kind of, at the, kind of at the top of Mayo almost. And uh, so, I kind of did a little bit of you know googling about it and didn't really kind of uh, thought you know oh I'll go back and have a look at that or something. But even before that, about six years ago, I've written about this before on my blog, but kind of my mother is adopted and we didn't really know a whole lot. She didn't really know a whole lot about where she came from. And I can remember it was when I was still in my first secondary school and I remember telling the kind of SNA that I was friendly with and she's basically my only friend in secondary school. Anyway, she, uh, so we got my mum's original actual birth cert, um, uh, you know, in the post. So she wasn't the name she is now. She was the name she had back when she was born. And the location of birth said best for a house. So I was kind of thinking, what in the name of heck is best for a house? And I did a bit of Googling, and the first thing I saw was a BBC article about the history of it, and it was a mother and baby home. So it was the same kind of umbrella that Tume had fallen under, too. And then I thought, okay, you know, these seem to have come up a lot. And this home ran from 1922 to 1998. It was one of the longest-running ones. And my mother was one of them. And the one thing that I found with this one is that there were 923 children who died there over the course of the 76 years and then you had um then you had uh 859 of them are still missing no one knows where they're buried and it was that that kind of you know you know beat into me like my mum could have been number 924. Like, she could easily not have survived it. And we weren't really sure, kind of, um, you know, how long she spent there. For a while, I said that it was two months. But kind of in, I'll get to that bit more, but kind of based on the fact that mum knew that she's, she was born late November and she was adopted mid-January. So kind of we thought, oh, she's probably there for about two months. So kind of, you know, she survived. Um, you know, being there. And then we, I, uh, I mean, I had gone looking more into modern baby homes. And the one thing I looked for, weirdly, I don't even know why I looked for it, but kind of the one thing I looked for was a database of those that died in modern baby homes, because I was curious, you know, curiosity and all that. And there wasn't one. And I thought, okay, where are the names for these children then? And the journal had published the names of the tune babies and the Irish Examiner had done their whole front page in January 2021 of the names of the Vespera babies. Um, and I thought, okay, but how many more were there? And the Commission of Investigation into Modern Baby Homes looked at 18 and I couldn't find names for the other 16. So I thought, okay, you know, let's see if I can have a go. And I went looking at, you know, I picked a house off the list, and that was Kilrush Nursery in County Clare, uh, which ran for only 10 years from 1922 to 32. And I kept thinking, oh, I, I can find the names. Like, these death entries are right here in plain sight. I'm looking at them. And I thought, because I had always wanted to do a project at some point. I had started doing a one-place study and found it might necessarily have been the thing for me to do. Uh, I just, personally, I didn't think that kind of that was the best thing for me to do. Uh, I just didn't click with me or whatever. And I thought, you know what, I'll give this a try. And, uh, you know, I started off kind of researching. I spent three days flat, like three full days from like morning till evening. Uh, researching uh, the children that died in the Kilrush nursery 
and that was the first addition to Project Infant. And I thought, you know what, I want to, I want, I want to do more, and I want to kind of, you know, remember all of them because there were nine thousand children that died supposedly in the eighteen institutions that were investigated. So, like, I only had, I think, about two hundred and seventy. I think it's actually two hundred and seventy now because I found one today <laughs> uh, who died up in Dublin. Um, but kind of looking through, I thought there's still so much more to do, and. I quickly found that there's still, you know, a lot that the government haven't done or, in my opinion, are doing the bare minimum in some cases. And that's where I wanted to kind of, you know, step up and try and do, um, you know, something forward. It's like, I'm not getting paid. Like, this is all my own time and my own kind of funds kind of funding this. And I honestly wouldn't change it. So we ended up so obviously they were the main catalysts that you had so many children that were missing that hadn't been found the names of a lot of them weren't known uh my mom being born there and the thought oh could that loftus and tune be related to me even though they weren't so like that was the kind of main things and then that all kind of tumbled into this big research project that i thought i probably would have given up in a month but uh it is now 16 months uh in a day's time it's currently the 15th of november so 16 months tomorrow will be when i started it and it's honestly been the most kind of i suppose intense 16 months kind of trying to you know build up the content that's on it and just try and research these names because Every time that I looked at the government statistic report, obviously they weren't going to name every child in the report, but kind of they didn't make an effort to name any of them. And I thought, well, that's not right. Like the, the, these children, you know, they existed, they were people and they deserve to be remembered appropriately, not just by a number. And, you know, all of that kind of tumbled into me wanting to do this database. And right now I think we're up to 3,700 odd people on the side wow Dan. Dan for anybody who's not from this country right who has never heard of a mother and baby home can you just explain what they are yeah I can so um mother and baby homes were mainly set up in 1922 was kind of when you find most of them setting up and starting up most not all but um they were kind of I suppose the general thing was the people were calling for separate institutions for women, uh, mothers and their children to be because typically before that they were housed in workhouses where you could have, you know, illness and you have uh, all sorts of people in it. And they wanted, I think, kind of it. the general idea was to kind of have a separate place for these women and children to kind of like be raised. And at the start, kind of, I think people thought it was a very good idea. And kind of when the first one was kind of, I suppose, set up, the first one would have been, uh, the first one might have actually been Pelletstown, which is in uh, which is in Dublin City in a place in, in an area called Cabra. Um, but these homes were meant to, now, it also depends on actually what kind you're on about, because you've got modern baby homes, you've got Magdalene homes, you've got... Um, Oh, goodness, you've got all sorts of ones. Uh, children's homes, orphanages, you know, it depends which one you're on about. But mother and baby homes would be typically for women, in, in a sentence would be for women to uh, give birth to their children. And it was typically unmarried mothers. However, they were kind of uh, places for married women to give birth to. But nine times out of ten, it was probably an unmarried mother who was going into it. And obviously at the time, uh, getting pregnant and having a child outside of marriage was seen as a sin. And kind of the um, the idea was um, that, you know, my, uh, you know, the idea in the eyes of the church was that my own grandmother, who had my mom, had sinned by having a child uh, outside of marriage. And, you know, 
the the general kind of force around that was uh for penitence so you know for women to pay for these sins and that often took the form of hard labor while being pregnant so scrubbing floors doing loads of cleaning like whatever it is and uh they could be in there for a number of months so i think my own uh i think my grandmother was in there for maybe three months um and typically you would be greeted and this is based off of kind of other accounts that i've heard from people you would be you'd go in and you would be greeted by the nun and you would be given a house name so say if uh i always call my grandmother anna when i'm whenever i'm referring to her because i think it's still sensitive to kind of bring it up so i kind of give her an alias and i'm referring to her so if anna was her name she's given a house name which wasn't her own one so for three months of her life anna was bernardine uh, so why they did that dan do we know why they gave them those names they gave them because they didn't want the other women to know who each other were who who each other mm -hmm. were so it was basically you were somebody else and there was one i was at the best for a commemoration this year giving a, a very short talk uh, and a uh, well, more sort of speech and there was one mother who was there in resbrun in the 1980s and how she was, how she kind of saw being given that house name as being stripped of her identity. Oh, so I, yeah. think, I, I like, think she was dear. I think her name was Deirdre and she was given Claire or something. I was going to say, a bit like, like sort of when you go in the workhouse and you give up your clothes and you put on the workhouse uniform, you yeah. know, that, that identity of, of you and, and what you wear went, didn't it? And you put on this uniform and now you're part of an institution. So it's like when yeah. you come in, your name is gone, you know, you your identity is gone and you have this exactly. alias. Yeah. Yeah. And typically you'd be in there for a number of months and potentially even a period of time after the birth has occurred. Mm -hmm. So I don't know how long my grandmother was still in Besborough after my mum was born. But she she might have been there for a week or two after. Um and kind of it was basically, you know, you were meant to, so like, nurse the child, you were given maybe like 20, 30 minutes to go in, you know, uh, breastfeed the child, and then go out again. Like, you were not to bond with this child. Right, and okay. kind of, so, so that would have been, been the general idea with how most of these things worked. And then they would either be, you would typically be adopted out, however, there has been evidence and many proven cases that, uh, basically these babies were sold abroad so typically they were sent they were sent to the u.s and the uh case if you ever watch it uh is the movie philomena with judy dench and steve coogan uh based on a true story of a woman named philomena lee uh talking about her son anthony who was born in shawness abbey and uh he was sent off to america to live there and I think became Michael Hess and Michael Heiss. I can't, I can never get the pronunciation right, so I apologize. Um, so, uh, and you know, I won't get the whole thing away, but it's definitely worth a watch as it is based on a true story and kind of how I suppose how women were treated in the homes and how there was still obviously a stigma around, you know, being unmarried and having a child and i had read now in july of 2022 there was a birth information and tracing act uh brought into law uh and that october is the day before my birthday so the 3rd of october 2022 there was a service called birthinfo.ie which is a service uh for tusla the uh our our ireland's family uh uh, so like you know a social worker will try and you know uh, get your files um, for from when you were in the modern baby home or whatever institution you may have been in so for whatever info they can give on you and we got my mom's 
So we requested in January. We didn't do it straight away because we weren't ready just yet. So we did it January the 11th and we got her files back September the 8th, which is near enough eight months. It was 240 days, uh, nearly eight months after, uh, you know, we put in the request. And in theory, we should have gotten them in 30 days. I was going to say, was that, is that because there's so many to process and it took so long? Or was there something um, to do with it, maybe incompetence? I think the general reason and the general explanation was that there was a massive backlog. Oh, and yeah. I mean, why wouldn't there be? Because this, yeah, is, cool. this is a groundbreaking law to try and get, you know, for adoptees to try and get their info. Because it was basically, you know, and I hate to put this morbidly, but it was like, you know, you were trying to part info from, from like the dead almost sometimes, mm -hmm. you know. You, you might have had better luck with that than you would have had to kind of go through hurdles. Like, and, and like, for my mom, we got her file back, and I was both horrified, equally horrified mm -hmm. and surprised at the kind of what was in it. So you, it was basically a PDF file with about 30 pages in it. Half of, half of it was database stuff so i don't know why it took from april to september to compile all of it if it was all in a database it should have been very easy to find but it wasn't um and uh we got this 30 page file back and in it was letters of correspondence between religious orders so uh you had the nun in Besbra and the nun in Stamullen, which is where my mum was sent up to. So we thought she was in Besbra for two months, like I said earlier. She's actually in there for two weeks. And then was sent up to Stamullen uh, to be adopted by my uh, grandparents, Colm and Kathleen. Mm -hmm. And they... Um, I mean, it was surreal because later on, it was letters between my grandmother, Anna, and the nuns, and they were basically praising her for not being greedy and wanting to kind of take my mum. Now, she she had willingly given her up for adoption. She knew that she wasn't going to be able to give her the life that she deserved. So it was not like forced separation in my mum's case. Yeah. So, and honestly, I was, I was crying, basically, reading these letters between my mum or, 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 or my and between Anna and the religious orders because it was basically you had uh you know I I, I trust you have the clothes that I, I, I gave when I went there and you know to put the the little medal or something uh, that I also gave uh on on the little jacket that I that was part of the clothes and you know it was it, it was it was hard. Anna had um, gone up a couple of times mm -hmm. um, to actually visit my mum mm -hmm. while she was in Stamullen before she was adopted. And the last one was saying, you know, basically, you know, I can't bring myself to kind of go back again. And I was and I just thought, oh, Anna, you know, it, it was so hard to read. And like, you know, me and my mum, we were trying. We were we 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 were crying and hugging at the same time, and we were just trying to, you know, it. I mean, I mean, I was kind of doing more of the crying, but kind of, um, it was just kind of so hard to kind of see it written in the in a letter, like her oh, handwriting. Daniel, you've got me. And oh god. Sorry, I was trying to make this a little more lighthearted, but it was going to take a dark turn anyway. And um, she, so that was kind of the harder part of it, but kind of the more bit that made me a little more worried or, or more horrified, I suppose, that the right word that I had, uh, as if it was a bit more colorful language. But basically, on the baptismal register, because my mum was baptized at Bez for a couple of days after she was born, she had so in the baptismal register it gave the name of you know my grandmother which we knew so it said anna but her real name um and you know it said where she was from and you know where she was baptized and when and by who but there was one field 
at the end where it said it gave my father's name, their marriage date, the church and the postcode they got married in, in there, black and white, and my mum's name. Now, and I should also just disclose, this: they didn't get married in Ireland, they got married in London. So, you can imagine that I'm questioning how they, first of all, got that info, because it was one, in a different country, and two, she was only in their care for two weeks. So how they had, when my mum got married to my dad, you know, and I this uh, and I'm not gonna, I'm not trying to give away their own uh, info here, but like you know, when they got married, they didn't have a marriage announcement. There was no online yeah, thing, yeah, nothing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like, yeah. there was no way they. Mm. I would have thought they could have found out unless, and like my mom and someone had kind of suggested to me, oh, what if she, what if um you know she had to get proof of her baptism? She's baptized. The baptism she had was under her her name now it wasn't under her birth name she only knew her birth name a couple of years ago so she couldn't have turned around and said oh my name is blah but my actual name at birth because i'm adopted was this and then they could go back and go like oh this is it so they managed to somehow find that out and i just find it so ridiculous that they turn around and say oh well we don't actually know who those 859 children are and it was, oh, it was unbelievable because it made me angry. Like, I get queries saying, oh, I'm just after finding out that, you know, my mother had a baby in a modern baby home. Where do I go? Like, this isn't well documented in terms of. So what I do is I take I take queries from people who say I found out that my mother had a baby in a modern baby home and can you help me so kind of i try i've gotten a few queries where some people have come to me looking to try and find the names of uh the children who were born there and granted these would have happened probably in the 30s or the 40s or the 50s or whenever the children were born and the biggest kind of help for that has been the Irish Civil Registration Index, and I'll tell you why. Because more often than not, it will give the mother's maiden name. And if it was an unmarried mother, so let's say John Smith was born in Besborough, uh, John Smith's mother's maiden name would also be Smith. Uh, so you'd be able to, there's a few telltale signs that you'd look out for to try and establish kind of what child is which. Now, I never say, you know, I am 100% sure that this is the one. I give, okay, based on the criteria you gave me, these are the ones that I'm coming up that fit the criteria. So, and then it's up to this person if they want to go and find the search themselves and buy it. But what I have done more recently is I've looked into, uh, people have given me query, or uh, I've gotten queries from people who know uh, stuff about their uh, birth parents or parents and want to know more so i can talk about this now that it's over and done with and i got permission but there was one case and it was for a 94 year old adoptee and she she's so sweet uh i was just about to leave the Besbrook commemoration and this lady came up to me and said you might be the man i'm looking for and i thought okay let's see where we go and she brought up her 90, 94 year old mother and she was saying, you know, can you tell them, uh, can you tell him, you know, what you know? And, uh, you know, I gave her my contact information and we chatted, uh, chatted for a while trying to, you know, just try and write up what info we had. And, you know, I got this, this and this. And long story short, I was able to give her back up to her grandparents uh in terms wow. of family tree and uh i was able to give her the, and it was so great because i was thinking i need to get this done i want to give her answers because she, any adoptee would probably be hitting roadblocks with tusla 
we hit roadblocks. I hit roadblocks. So, like, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a common thing. And I don't think there's any fault of the social workers there. And I think that's kind of what some people might attribute it to. I think it's because of the backlog and kind of the, I think, unrealistic parameter they set in thinking, oh, yeah, we, we'll get it done in 30 days. I think that was unrealistic from the start. And I think they were already up against it from the very beginning. And Can I of... just ask you a quick question, Dan, right? Yeah, go for so, it. So there's probably somebody listening to this who has just got a certificate, come through their door, and they found out that they have a relative that was born in a mother and baby home. Yeah. So where do they go, right? Where do they start looking? What, what, what do you do if this comes up in your family tree? I would frame this from the point of if I didn't know Anna's name and we discovered, oh, this is your mother's name. So it would give the name, so it would say Anna uh, Jeffries, that's not her actual name, uh, Anna Jeffries, and she was 28 or 27. And you'd, and it would actually give a residence of where the person was. So she was in Waterford. Uh, and I'm not going to go any more specific than that. But uh, I was able to kind of now, thankfully, Anna's name was very uh, rare, so it didn't take me long to find them. But what people will come to me is saying, you know, oh, I only have a couple of details, and you know, often it's the small details. And as silly as it sounds, it's often the kind of things that someone might consider irrelevant that might help figure it out. For example. Um, you know, it had kind of like from stuff from Penny Stories, you know, it might have said, you know, oh, uh, someone had loads of sisters. And if I'm finding a family with, so again, civil registration index is handy because if you go on family search or find my past or ancestry or whatever site you want to use to look at this uh, collection, you can look at, um, so you could do, okay, so I'm looking for Anna Jeffries. Mother's maiden name, uh, Coughlin. And you can look at, oh, here's one. And again, there was only one person for Anna. Um, but uh, you can just get rid of the name Anna and then you can look for any children with the Jeffrey surname, but the mother's yeah. maiden surname, Coughlin. And that kind of brought up a number of other uh, siblings uh, for that person. And then you can think, Oh, well, yeah, it did say that, uh, you know, that Jane had two sisters or and a brother. And, you know, it's small details like that that can help you refine it down. With, be uh, with the best ones, if it gave you an age, it gave you an idea of where you were looking. So if you had a rather common name, you could kind of refine it down to maybe like a three year. So you could kind of go maybe... Uh, let's say the person was born in 1945. So you could kind of do 1944, 45, and 46, kind of if you weren't exactly sure. Um, so, because uh, sometimes the age might not necessarily be correct. But honestly, it's the locale that will help. So a combination of the name, the year, or the age, and the locale of where the person is can often help you to find the person. Now, it's not always as easy as that, but that's kind of, uh, it depends on the case. And what happened then to, to Anna? So obviously she had your mum, your mum goes in the home. Did you find out, like, did she remarry or, you know, uh, like, like, did she have any more kids? Like, sort of, were you yeah. curious to find out what had happened after that she, point? She did. Now, again, I had run the piece by my mum because I had written about this before. Uh, and she said, yeah, that's fine because uh, I'm not giving away any pers uh, identifying course, information. Yeah. So after my mum was born, uh, my mother, or, uh, Anna, had another uh, child who I'll call Rochelle, yeah. uh, and then later had uh, married and then had two more, uh, Eric and Eve. And we had met Eric, Eve, uh, Anna and Rochelle, and it was brilliant. Because wow, so you got to meet Anna? Anna, did you? I did. Wow. Anna right, okay. is alive and well. And, you know, I got there's a, I got a photo of uh, my mom, Rochelle, Anna, Eric and Eve all standing together. And it was so weird because you could actually see the resemblance. Like my mom is a spitting image of Anna. 
like if you kind of held a photo of the two of them up together you could easily see you know how similar they are and it was so weird because you know like we've good relationships with like my mum's adoptive family and you know <laughs> we wouldn't change that and but kind of the weird part was they didn't necessarily look anything like us and you as irrelevant as it is you know you would kind of think you know well you know it, they don't necessarily look like me but when you sit Anna and mom next to each other it's it's spooky and like it it was um, it was amazing like initially kind of and honestly they're they they they've all got their whatsapp group now and they're all chatting and it's so lovely and yeah. like they're all keeping in contact and it's honestly and i'm co-writing a piece with my mom at the moment but one quote i did want to share is so like you know uh, uh, it's sort of like you know as much as you want the relationship, so like like a mother and daughter bond, it won't be there because of the. I'm not trying to age your brother, like fifty year separation. You know, mm. it it like because of that, you know, it won't quite be a traditional thing. But they'll still be great. That's friends. all right. Yeah, but that's the thing that I think that's okay. Yeah. I think I work with a lot of unknown parentage cases, and I think people think that you know. Like, what sort of relationship are we going to have if we find that person? What sort of relationship yeah. are we going to have with our new siblings that we didn't know about before? And yeah, and whatever and... form that takes, you know, whether you speak every day. Like, I have a client. I found his birth family, and he speaks to his half sister. You know, every day, right? But some people it doesn't work like that. And I think whatever no. relationship you find, you will find a relationship that works for you. And I think yeah. that is the most important thing. Can I just ask one more question, Dan? Right. So obviously, oh, so obviously you found Anna now. Yeah. Is your mum keen to know more about bi a biological father, or is she not interested? And the other question I was going to ask um, you in all of this, yeah, is has DNA helped on this journey? Okay, this is going to be fun to answer. So <laughs> we do know. Um, my mom's actual uh father's name, mm -hmm. and uh, I use Smith quite a lot as an example. Yeah, which is ironic. I I I had always said to mom, "Oh, uh, you know, I I I now call it karma in genealogy, and you'll, and and why I call it that is because I jokingly said to my mom, you know, oh, forget your file, you know, if we ever find out your dad's name." Imagine if they were Smiths. And I kid you not, when we scrolled down to the page that gave father's name, his name was Smith. And I almost thought, well, that's me done then. Well, I was going to say, they're not from Cavan, are they? Because my, all my family is Smiths from Cavan. No, Waterford. My, right. No matter how hard we try, be it my mum's adopted family or her birth family, they never leave Waterford. Right, okay. <laughs> so Fair enough. They are st stuck in Waterford. Yeah. Um. So, kind of, we do know his name. Mm -hmm. I don't know if my mum wants to kind of go... Go, de go there. Them just yeah. yet. I think yeah. she kind of wants to kind of, you know, take a bit of time to, like, process it because i think i think we're still both processing it this uh even today just so like you know this is information that my mom had never had access to for years and for what like you know and i really hate it because the common air that you get with the doctors is that they're being infantilized again as if they don't know best and kind of with my mom like you know she deserved to know like she, and like you know, like imagine if you had a health scare and you can't get that information because it's locked away, and like you know, it's it, it's abysmal personally. But like with with my uh, biological uh, grandfather, uh, just for the sake of this, we'll call him. I almost said one name, which is his actual name. <laughs> we'll call him Chris. So Chris had um uh. From what we can gather, he married and had a number of um, 
other kids. And from what I can potentially find from my DNA matches is I found my more of his grandchildren. Okay. So more first cousins, well, half first cousins of mm-hmm. mine. Mm-hmm. And so with, so with the um, Santa Morgans coming up quite high then, Dan, on, on these potential relatives? I think one of them might have been... F- I think one of them was 700 and the other was 500. Wow, yeah, so they're, t- they're pretty high, yeah. Yeah, so kind of from what we can tell, they're my first cousins and they're my mum's niece and nephew. Mm-hmm. So you've got a uh, Jeremy and Catherine, we'll call mm-hmm. them. Yeah. yeah. And um, they are kind of the closest matches on uh, my dad's, or on her dad's side. But there's kind of one person, because we weren't contacting anyone just yet, because we were kind of thinking, okay, how do we want to approach this? I was going to say, um, like, have they seen the matches and reached out to you? Because I've I've been reaching out to quite a few people, <laughs> and it's I always okay. find it the most awkward thing ever, like sending yeah. that initial email. And often, if it's a high sense Morgan match, and I have a good idea, or I think I have a good idea of how how that person is related to somebody that I'm researching I kind of want them to figure it out for themselves so I'm like oh yeah. have you seen you are a match with so and so oh that's a really high number um have you thought about you know I kind of want them to sort of go oh yeah I get, I get are what they you mean. my auntie rather than me going, yeah oh by the way I found you I found you a new auntie um have a yeah. you know have a nice night what are you having for tea pizza yeah just let you know your granddad was unfaithful. Yeah, you know, can you imagine? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, and that was the thing, because we weren't exactly sure how we were going to approach it. So in terms of uh, Jeremy and Catherine, Jeremy has not logged in uh, since we've taken our tests. We both did it together. I felt so sorry for my mum because she had to do it again because the first one, it didn't go through right. So, like, I was there and, like, mum's, like... I was going to say... Mum was just, like... That's happened to one of my clients this week, right? So I had to go back to him. I know. So I've been doing the, the DNA of somebody who, again, is coming on the podcast. And yeah. he doesn't know who his dad is. And I right. was like, look, what I said, obviously, my normal protocol is that if I find who your dad is, I would obviously not want to announce that on a podcast. Yeah. So, yeah, of you know, but he, because he's like TV, he's like, no, no, it's fine. I'm more than happy. Just tell me on the podcast. We'll change his name. I was like, are you sure? Like, you know, that'll be the first time you're going to hear it. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, that's fine. So I was like, oh. I mean, it depends on person. It's your preference. decision. Yeah, it's your decision. But anyway, so I got a message back. And it's the first time it's ever happened. Basically saying yeah. that they couldn't extract his DNA. <laughs> so, yeah, that, was, that was the same yeah. thing. And mum was like, muted. this special work. Yeah. And like, you know, kind of thinking this special work this time or else I'm not doing it. I'm taking it as a sign to not do it. Yeah. And I'm thinking, please go through with it. Yeah. And I'm I'm really glad that she went through with it because there was one match. Because I was going through my matches and I thought, oh, well, we are screwed here. You know, we're, yeah. we're not getting anywhere. So there was one um, match who I'll call Mary mm-hmm. uh, and was showing up as a sixth to eighth cousin as 11 centimorgans. So I was kind of thinking, oh, great. You know, I literally went through top to bottom. What can I find? On my mum's, however, second to third. So there is a very significant difference. So I'm really glad that she had you know went for it again and it went through actually with mary because mary's on my mum's dad's side Mm -hmm. she reached out okay yeah (laughs) and uh she i kind of said hi you know i don't seem to know where you fit in can you help me figure it out sort of thing because like this woman had a fairly comprehensive family tree and thought Oh dang! Like you know, this is this 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 might not go well. And the thing we just ended up saying was so like you know, oh, mum's adopted. Because we're not exactly lying; she is, and we didn't really know much about that family tree. Mm. And kind of you know, they went back and forward, and kind of you know, I didn't still exchanging information. But one of the things that kind of me and mum kind of were like, uh oh, kind of uh, Mary kind of said. You know, you look really familiar. 
And like, you know, you really look like, you know, they didn't give a name, but you really look like one of my close family members. And we thought, like, oh, oh, that could be. <laughs> and I, I'm, I, 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 I told mom. I don't think she said it yet, but kind of, I was, I was tempted to kind of tell her, like, care to tell us who? Like, you know, can, can it give us a little? Yeah, yeah, can it give us like a little pointer or yeah. anything? Yeah. Uh, but we haven't sent it yet. But kind of, Mary's been the only kind of cousin that has actually reached out on that side. On Anna's side, no one. Um, but there actually aren't very many matches on her. So kind of actually there aren't very many matches on my mum's at all. Kind of my dad has double what my mum has practically. Daniel Loftus, can I just say a huge, huge thank you for coming on the podcast. When he came on, by the way, folks, when he first logged on, I said to him, just to let you know, this is probably not like the normal podcast you do. Like I have the naughtiest dog in the world and let me tell you he has lived up to his reputation during this podcast he has a hairbrush he's ripped up an envelope he was humping my arm for a good 20 minutes while Daniel was saying something like really quite emotional um yeah he's been an absolute nightmare a nightmare so if you are coming on this podcast just be warned you know you (laughs) I don't know what's gonna happen I don't know what's gonna happen Dan, can I just say, so I'm, I don't know how I'm going to do this. This podcast at the moment is an hour and a half. I have to somehow magically get this to half an hour. We have chatted on for that long. I really hope you Sorry. Come. No, no, no. Oh, my goodness. No way. I was kind of thinking, ah, oh, I probably talked on for a bit. Obviously, no. kind of you'll be able to chop out a couple of bits. But yeah. Kind of if- but can I just say, Thank you so much, and I'll hope you. I hope you come back on at some point, and we'll do a part two. <laughs> oh God! I'd yeah. Do oh one, please, you know? yeah. Please come back on and do a part two, especially like because we've spoke about the amazing research you're doing. So if you've got any updates, or even if you've got a project on the go, and you know you're happy and you want to come on and talk about it, Dan, please come back on because I've had a great. Oh, yeah. I've had a great time. <laughs> I've had a great time. Great. I'm glad. I, yeah, I've laughed. I've cried. You're the first person that's actually made me cry on a podcast. So, yeah, thank you. Uh, I've laughed. I've cried. You know, it's been a great, uh, you know, a, a great emotional roller coaster. So, Dan, thank you. Thank you so much. Now, can I just say a huge thanks again to everybody for listening? Um, I really, really appreciate it. I love it when you send me messages and send me uh, tweets. And, and, and message me through my website if you don't know what my website is it's www.michaelahume.com find me on social media Dr. Michaela Hume remember Michaela's got no E in it my mum was weird she thought she was being quirky it's ruined my life um, but yeah if you need to get a hold of me please do if you want to get a hold of Dan I've put if you read the, uh, the description of the podcast I've put a link to, to Dan's social media and also to his website, and also to the brilliant work he's been doing on mother and baby homes, which is absolutely fascinating. And I hope he comes back on to talk about that because um, it's a really great project that he's, he's working on there. I hope to see you again next week. Have a good week researching. Goodbye.